Uh, today, we are in Acts chapter 15, finishing up the Jerusalem Council. Last, last week, we, we read the first 21 verses and found out why they needed a council, a church council. And this was the first one in, in church history where the, the church in Antioch, 300 miles north of Jerusalem, came all the way down to Jerusalem. And both of these churches got together in order to decide exactly what we believe as a church in terms of salvation. And that's, that's a pretty big deal. There are a lot of major issues in Scripture that we can't compromise on, but there's, there's also a lot of minor issues that we should compromise on at times, or at least we can make allowance for that. Um, because we tend to disagree on a lot of things, and, it, and that's just natural. It's human nature. We come from different backgrounds. We have different parents. We have different families. We have different cultures. Some of us, different languages, different races. Like We just are different people. So we're going to come to the table bringing different things and disagreeing on some things, like which way the toilet paper should go. It's obviously over, um, but uh, toothpaste, you know, is a screw cap which I think those are the best, or it's a snap cap, you know. But there are other things we dis- disagree on, which are probably more practical. could be a budget, or a building expansion, or a change to the service order, or the type of worship music. Other things are theological, like sign gifts, for instance. Are, were they just for the apostles of the first century, or are they still in existence today? Like, we disagree on some of those things with people. The doctrine of election. Who's elected? How does that work? The age of the earth. In times. Those I would consider to be minor issues in the church because salvation, what we talked about last week, who can be saved and what do they have to do? Like that's an important question because depending on how you answer that question determines this answer. Well, if they're not the right person and they're not doing the right things, then they're lost for all of eternity, separated from Christ, not just now but forever. So that would be a pretty crucial question that they need to find an answer to. Whereas if it's something to do with end times, and you and I don't necessarily agree with certain details, that doesn't really change someone's like eternity necessarily. So as long as they believe Jesus is coming back, we're good. We may disagree on some details, but again, those can be minor issues that we can at least have unity together. But salvation is one of those things where we can't compromise on the truth. So anything having to do with the deity of Christ, the, uh, which means that he's God. He's God's only son. He died on the cross for our sins, was buried in the grave, and on the third day rose from the dead. Like Any of those things, those are things that we can't compromise on. Those are major issues. But other things like sign gifts, all these other things, those are minor issues. So disagreements happen. And for many things, that's okay. But the question regarding salvation is a big deal. Because, again, we're talking about someone's eternal life, someone's eternal security. So that was the question last week. The question this week is basically what hills should we die on? What hills should we die on? Um, And this passage, also what we learned last week and what we kind of get into today, teaches us a little bit of, of what we should do with conflict and how we should manage conflict in the church. When some of the Jews came from Jerusalem and Judea, 300 miles north to Antioch, to teach things that were contrary to what the apostles had been teaching them, uh, there was conflict. Paul and Barnabas didn't just kind of step away and pretend that it didn't exist, you know, hoping that it would go away. You know, we do that sometimes, and sometimes it works, but we can't always pretend like it's not there. We need to confront it. They confronted the conflict. They sought wise counsel. They went to Jerusalem to meet with the elders, the apostles, and the whole church in order to decide what we believe as a church, what God's word teaches. They listened to both sides of the argument. They listened to Paul and Barnabas, but they also listened to the Pharisees, to the people who believed that you have to be circumcised, that you have to do all of these other things, rituals, regulations, laws. They evaluated certain experiences. Um, Peter stood up with, with the 11. He stood up and said, men of Israel, Gentiles, everyone here, like, don't you remember 10 years ago? When I went to Cornelius' house and I preached the gospel and I wasn't even done speaking and the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. Like Cornelius wasn't circumcised. For lunch we had bacon. Like we were doing a lot of different things that we're not supposed to do as Jews, but yet the Holy Spirit filled them. And so they evaluated experiences and James specifically looked into the scriptures. 
he quoted from the Old Testament and showed and proved to them that this was God's plan all along. This is the next step in the program. This is like phase two of what we're talking about. And they compromised on the minor issues. They compromised on the minor issues. So James basically ended the argument saying, we don't need to burden the Gentiles. Gentile is just someone who's not a Jew. We don't need to burden them with all of these rituals and laws and regulations. What they need to do is believe in Christ and they'll be saved. John 3.16 says, Whoever believes in him, the only son, will not perish but have eternal life. Whoever, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of language or nationality, whoever believes in Christ will be saved. So that offer of salvation is offered to everyone. Compromises, minor compromises happen all the time. Marriages, church, friendships, in the business world. I was at Dunkin' Donuts yesterday and, uh, you know, the cashier, they're wearing the shirts that says Dunkin' Donuts, and I'm asking them, I thought they changed their name, um, you know, just Dunkin'. And so the cashier was like, let me lay it down for you. And he said, so what happened was they did change their name. It's just Dunkin' now. They dropped the, dunk, the donuts part. Um, but it's up to the franchise owners whether or not they want to basically change the name and go into phase two of Dunkin' Donuts. And so you can, if you want, as a franchise owner, you can maintain the old way, kind of the the way of tradition, or you can go along with Duncan and drop the donuts. You know, you you can drop the regulation. That's a lame uh, illustration. But anyway, I thought it was neat. You didn't really think it was funny. All right, but this leads into our passage today, where we find the effects of James' decision of what happened after they ended up sending a letter up to Jerusalem. So let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 15, verses 22, all the way through the end of the chapter. The Word of God says, Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves would tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord. And see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement. Two men who are faithful. Two men who are very faithful and prominent leaders in the church in Jerusalem. Judas and Silas. And these these guys come up later in the New Testament. Silas ends up, as we see at the end of this chapter, joining Paul on the second missionary journey, which we'll look at at the end. But, but these two are faithful men, leading men among the brothers. And the letter starts by saying, the brothers, those in Jerusalem, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles. So what James is doing right here is he's, he's including Jews and Gentiles. The Jerusalem church is predominantly Jewish. 
the, Anti- the church in Antioch is predominantly Gentile. James is saying from the brothers to the brothers. Like he's included. We're all in the same family. That's what James is doing. So he's starting the letter off well. And he says that this letter is for the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. But at first, at the beginning of this chapter, what we talked about last week, it just, it just said that the Jews had come up from Judea, from Jerusalem, all the way up north, 300 miles, to Antioch. And were teaching things contrary to what the Apostle Paul had taught them. But this shows us that this church in Antioch had been expanding. They had been taking the gospel further, planting churches throughout all of Syria and Antioch and in Cilicia. Cilicia is where Tarsus is. So after Paul got saved, he went to Arabia, then went to Damascus for three years. Then he went to Jerusalem after they wanted to kill him. And after a few days there, he went to Tarsus. And while he was there in Tarsus, you can imagine that he planted a church in Tarsus. And these were home churches, most likely. They weren't like our churches today. But Chris, is there a map uh, that I could just get up? So this is just a map. We'll use this more towards the end of the message today. But just for your visual reference, this is, this is where we go. So Cilicia is that blue area right above Antioch of Syria and Tarsus is right in that area. That's where Paul lived for a time. So he had gone. He had taken the word there. And verse 24 says, Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions. So James starts out one saying, This is what we've heard. There have been people come from our region all the way up north teaching you things that aren't true. And we just want to clarify right off the bat, we didn't send them. Like we didn't... They didn't come from us. They came from the region, but they're not sent from us. They, they're not teaching what, what we approve. They're teaching things contrary to the truth, and specifically words that are troubling these believers and unsettling them. And if you've ever struggled with doubt, that's kind of what causes us to be unsettled at times. Unsettled means to be worried, unresolved, uneasy, second-guessing. These Jews were stirring up doubts in minds of the Christians. And if you've ever struggled with doubt, then you know how unsettling that can be. But this is what we have to remember. God doesn't call us to live in fear, but in faith. God doesn't call us to live in fear, but in faith. Um, These words were troubling. And it's not like that old rhyme that we say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. These words were hurting the believers there. And that's why the church ended up appointing Paul and Barnabas and some of the other men to go down to Jerusalem to make a trip of over 300 miles to find out exactly what we should be teaching. And you can imagine these people aren't just now doubting their salvation, but there could be doubts on whether or not Paul and Barnabas have been teaching them correctly. And so that's what we're going to see because when James sends them back up, He affirms Paul and Barnabas in the people's minds. Like he's building them up in the letter so that the people don't doubt Paul and Barnabas anymore. But they see that these guys have risked their lives for the good news of Jesus Christ. They're faithful men and they're teaching you the truth. It says in verse 25, It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, meaning we're unified in our decision, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, again, affirming Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. So everything in this letter that we're sending to the church in Antioch, Judas and Silas are going to read you the letter, they're going to give you the letter, and they're going to be telling you and teaching you everything that's in the letter. Like They're not going to say anything that's not in that letter. Everything is going to be in agreement because they're not just going to get up there to Antioch and day one hand them the letter and then travel back. Um, They're not going to do that. They're going to be there for some time. And so they're going to be teaching and preaching and discipling. And so over the course of that time, though, everything that they say will be in full agreement with that letter and with the church and what they're teaching. James says, verse 28, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And then we get into that list of four different things. But basically, he's saying, like, who who are we to argue with God? 
The last person that argued with God was Job. And we, we praise Job because he didn't curse God. You know, he, he, he did a lot of good things. He was a faithful man, but he did challenge God. And he challenged and questioned God's motives and God's reasons and even God's goodness. But when God showed up, gave him a list of questions and started out like, Job, who are you? Where were you when I made the foundations of the world? Like, who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? I'm not subject to you, Job. You're subject to me. Your body is subject to me. Your life is subject to me. And I can do whatever I want. That's basically what God is saying. I have authority over all the heavens and the earth, over every single person's life. When uh, Peter was jealous of John at the end of, uh, Jesus had just risen from the dead. And they're hanging out with Jesus. And, and Jesus says, Peter, you're going to be killed like I was on a cross. And Peter looks at John. And says, well, what about him? And Jesus says, well, if he lives until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. I'm in charge. All right? And this is what Job had to realize. This is what Peter had to realize. And this is what James realized. Like, who are we to argue with God? The Holy Spirit is filling these people, saving these people, and dwelling these people. And they're not being circumcised. They're not doing the food laws. They're not doing all the different requirements. And yet it seems good to the Holy Spirit, so it's, Good to, it's good with us. If it's good with God, it's good with us. We're not going to argue with him. And in Acts 15.20, going back to the first time James spoke about this, this, these four requirements, he says, we should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols. James didn't say to abstain from idols. He said to abstain from the things polluted by idols. So don't even get close. Don't tempt yourself. If, if you come from a society where, where this type of music or, or this form of activity or whatever it is like, would tempt you to go back into your old ways, into your old patterns, um, don't do it. Don't go close. There, there are tribes throughout the world that um, for centuries, for generations, like, they would have certain drum beats and, and musical instruments that was involved in idolatry and demonic worship. The gospel goes into the society, and they sacrifice that. They get rid of that from their culture. doesn't mean that the drum is a satanic instrument or that the guitar is a satanic instrument or anything. Like, it doesn't have anything to do with the instrument or the beat. It has everything to do with them. Because if they, that it's not society anymore, this is why I don't think that uh, the first three really ap- apply to us today. One, because they're not mentioned throughout the... It's, specifically eating animals with blood in them and uh, eating animals that were strangled, aren't mentioned after this point in the New Testament. For us, um, the abstaining from what has been sacrificed to idols is mentioned, but Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians that just don't ask. If you go to the market and buy some meat, don't ask where it came from. Don't ask how it was sacrificed. Just don't ask so that you can maintain a clear conscience. And so we don't really have this society, though. Um, you don't go to Walmart. And the butcher is like, oh, I sacrificed the Zeus earlier this morning. Like, that isn't normal. And if it is, you should go to a different Walmart. Um, but that's not our society. And if, if someone did tell me that or tell you that, most likely you're not going to be led into the idolatry of worshiping Zeus. That just doesn't happen in our Our, our form of idolatry is a lot more subtle in our day. Um, we worship the God of entertainment and the God of sex and the God of our cell phone. You know, we don't necessarily bow down to these things, uh, but we do with our lives because we spend more time than we probably should on these things. Um, but some cultures today eat blood pudding. Main ingredient is animal blood. I, if you eat that, you're like, I'm not going to judge you. I don't think you're sinning necessarily. To be honest, I don't think so, but I'm not going to come to your house for dinner. But I, that's nasty. Like, I'm just to be honest, blood pudding is, is disgusting. Sounds nasty. But some people eat that. Some people like it. That's their culture. Russian tribes, some Russian tribes in the north drink reindeer blood during the winter. And, well, it's winter there all the time. But um, they drink reindeer blood because there's nutrients in the blood that they need in that area to effectively survive in the area. 
So, you know, if it, again, if it leads you into idolatry, yeah, when the gospel would come in and they'd believe the word of God, they would need to change. Something would have to, uh, they'd have to adapt some way so that they're not led back into old patterns. But if it's just an act like that, well, they're trying to survive. Um, the sexual immorality, however, back in this day, sexual immorality was a little bit different. It, obviously, it was the same. You're still having a sexual affair that's outside of scripture. But for all of the temples and high places in the ancient world, um, all of them almost had prostitutes at at the temple. And so male prostitutes, female prostitutes, didn't matter. Just um, you, you went up there, you did your sacrifice, and then you uh, basically had a sexual affair with a prostitute. And they did that, one, because we're sinners and they liked the pleasure um, two, because they believed that it would help in fertility, uh, that the gods would bless them in their crops, that go- the gods would bring rains, that the gods would bless them. So they did this because of a lot of that. And again, that goes into the idolatry aspect. All of these things, if it leads you into idolatry, don't do it. Don't let there be a hint of sexual immorality even among you. And sexual immorality is mentioned all throughout the New Testament about how it's wrong. It's wrong. All the way at the end in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 20, it even says uh, all the sexual, sexually immoral will be cast into the lake of fire. So this is not a good thing in Scripture. So we want to avoid that. So that would be a moral law. That's one of the Ten Commandments to don't commit adultery. So that does still apply to us. But the blood thing, strangled animals, um, even though it's not really our culture, I don't think it really applies to us. This does not necessarily mean, you know, if you like your steak rare um, or a little pink. I'm not sure if you could really ever get every molecule out of a piece of meat of blood unless you burn it. But, um, again, that's just not ours, not our culture. But the truth, what we see here, the truth was sent to the church in Antioch. So they, they discussed all of these things in Jerusalem. And the truth was sent up to Antioch. So now the church knows exactly what to do and what they believe. We may not always agree with certain compromises. These were some compromises that that James made and the the Jerusalem church made for the Christians in Antioch. Basically saying, love your Jewish brothers and sisters. Whenever you have them over, like don't have pepperoni and pizza. You know, don't do different things like this. Love them, care for them, don't lead them into sin. Um, And so we may not always agree, but we should seek to encourage and strengthen one another. And that's the second point. The Christians were strengthened by the church in Jerusalem. So the truth was sent to the church in Antioch, and the Christians there were strengthened by the church in Jerusalem. It says in verse 30, when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. They actually gave it to them. And when they had read it, there was much rejoicing. They rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time there, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So they brought the letter. There was much rejoicing. Everybody was super excited to hear the truth. Um, and this, but this is a contrast right here. Initially, the Jews who came up from Jerusalem to Antioch brought words that were troubling them and unsettling them. But these guys brought words that were strengthening them and were encouraging them. And that should be the contrast. The world is going to bring words that trouble us. But we as Christians, our lives should be different. We should bring words that strengthen people, words that encourage people. You know, we should be positive, encouraging Caleb. No, but we should we should be uplifting. We should be burden lifters in our society. And I I believe I'm going to I'm going to tell you at, at the end of this section right here. There's a level of ambiguity, but I believe that this is where Galatians 2, 11 through 14 fits in. Galatians 2:11 through 14 says when Cephas came to Antioch Cephas is Peter's other name this guy is a man of many names um, but when Cephas came to Antioch I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned 
For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And I believe that this, that, that section right there, that account that Paul gives us in Galatians chapter 2, fits right in that passage. So J- Paul opposed Peter, the apostle, you know, the, the great apostle that he was. Paul opposed him to his face in front of everybody because Peter fell into peer pressure. Peter and Barnabas, two really great, high exalted leaders in the early church, fell into peer pressure. And the reason I say there's some ambiguity with that is because it could have happened at the end of Acts 11 during the famine when they go. There's just, we don't have a lot of information, so I'll leave it up to you. Next week, I, I, I want to bring a, a paper where I have like the chronology of Paul's ministry up to this point. Um, so if you're here next week, you can grab one of those. But Paul basically confronted Peter, opposed him to his face, and the whole temple like broke in half and the curtain tore is like kind of god tore the curtain well it's like they're trying to stitch it back up and god like tore the wall down the wall of hostility that we learned in ephesians but it's like they're trying to put it back up no god you made a mistake you know i'm we've got to put some cement on this wall and build it right back up paul does not want peter especially as an apostle does not want anybody to be building this wall back up we need to be mutually encouraging one another and strengthening one another because There's no distinction. We're in this together. And so level of ambiguity, take your pick. I'll have a chronology sheet next week for everybody. But basically, everything we say and everything we do should be done for the glory of God and for the benefit of other people. We should always use our words. We should always use our actions. We should always use everything that we have, everything that we are, to glorify God and to benefit other people for uh look for opportunities to say encouraging things that will strengthen them um though there will be times like peter the apostle that will fall and we'll fail and we will run into peer pressure we need one to learn to receive correction from others um but we also need to learn from the experience so that we can move forward so that when the next time comes around we don't so easily fall into peer pressure but we can be that contrast to the world. So the truth was sent to the church in Antioch. The Christians were strengthened by the church in Jerusalem. But the team, Paul and Barnabas, had separated due to conflict over Mark. Paul and Barnabas had separated due to conflict over Mark. Right between verse 35 and verse 36, this is most likely when the book of Galatians was written. So when Paul and Barnabas had spent some time still after the Jerusalem council, they were in Antioch. Paul, one, remember, he had this big dissension where all these Jews came up from Jerusalem and were teaching contrary. They were teaching all these things, circumcision and uh, the, the rituals and different things. And they had a heated debate, went to Jerusalem, came back with good news. All right, well, as they traveled on their first missionary journey, remember the, the Jews who hated Paul were following him to stone him. And they were going throughout these churches that he was planting in order to teach contrary to what he was saying. And so during this point right here, right before verse 36, would be when Paul hears the news that the Galatian churches, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, have fallen away from the faith. See, we, we get discouraged when uh, people of significant influence in the church fall away or commit some atrocious sin. But Paul had entire churches that were leaving the truth, entire churches. Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, And so he wrote the book of Galatians to rebuke them as the churches. That you were saved under grace, but now you're going towards the law. Who has deceived you? That's the whole book of Galatians. People have come in and deceived them into thinking that they need to do certain rituals and rites and regulations in order to be saved. And that's, that's the key. If somebody wants to do those things, that's fine. And we should make minor compromises for them or at least allow them to do that. But if somebody wants to do those things and believes that 
that's how they get saved, that's where the problem comes in. Because nothing saves us except the blood of Jesus Christ. Not the blood of idols, only the blood of the one true God, Jesus Christ. Verse 36 says, And after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. This stirred up dissension. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Acts chapter 15 begins with an argument, and it ends with an argument. This chapter begins with an argument and ends with an argument. The first argument was paramount. Like, that had to do with people's salvation. Like, that was a major issue. The second argument, the latter one, was preference. First was paramount. The second, the latter, was preference. They were right to remain uncompromising when it came to the word of God in regards to salvation, but they were wrong to remain uncompromising when it came to this right here. How hard, and if you just think about it, how hard would it have been for one of them to say, you know what, Barney, don't think of a purple dinosaur. His nickname is Barney. Anyway, you know what, Barney? We're, not, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on this. But you know what? If we split up, you take Mark and go south. You go to Cyprus. I'll take Silas and we'll go north. We'll go to the Galatian churches and kind of like revive them, help them kind of fix everything that's going on. How hard would it have been to do that? To just be humble. Instead, they had a sharp disagreement. Not, not anything paramount. Paul just couldn't get out of his own way in one sense. And Barnabas couldn't get out of his own way. But this is the danger of what tends to happen after a major victory. We were uncompromising over here and it worked out. Now we know how to handle things in life. And so we're uncompromising over here. I'm not relenting. I'm not willing to make a small compromise. And this is the danger also when we allow our emotions to get the best of us. It's not a sin to get angry, but it is a sin to allow anger to control you. James says, be slow to get angry. Ephesians chapter 4 says, be angry, but don't sin. Again, anger in itself is not a sin. Jesus was angry when they were selling things in the temple that they shouldn't have been selling. But if it controls you, if you allow your emotions to control you, that's when the sin comes in. We must wisely discern what issues merit compromise and which ones we can kind of slide under. Silas had come back to Antioch. Uh, Paul decided to to take Silas, so he had gone all the way back to Jerusalem and then I guess went back to Antioch and then they started their missionary journey. So this guy has been walking a lot. But this is the contrast also of sending Judas and Silas back in peace. They were sent out in peace in verse 33. Versus the sending out of Paul and Barnabas was not a peaceful situation. They were still commended to the grace of God by the brothers, but they were not sent out in peace. And God still used them. God still used them. That's key. There was like this split, this team split, this church split, whatever you want to call it. And it was a terrible situation. But God still used them even greater probably than they could have imagined because they were able to reach more people. They were able to go further and reach more and go farther and faster than ever before. Like God now had more missionaries on the field spreading the gospel. And even though Paul acted out in his frustration and stubbornness, eventually he came around. Towards the end of Paul's life, he said in 2 Timothy 4.11, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in ministry. So Paul eventually came around. He didn't live in pride. Like he learned his lesson. And in fact... It was John Mark, it was this Mark right here, who ended up writing Peter's testimony about Christ's ministry, the second book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. He wrote that book. This guy who abandoned them on the missionary journey, God used him to write that. 
towards the end of Paul's life, at least, they did resolve they did resolve this matter. And we should be seeking to bring about reconciliation. I know Christians um, who don't believe dot, dot, dot. So see if you fit into any of these or if you know people who do. All right. I know Christians who don't believe we should eat pork. They don't believe we should have church on Sunday. That's kind of ironic. They don't believe we should support Starbucks. I mean, Duncan's better anyway. But they don't believe we should support Starbucks. They don't believe we should celebrate Halloween or tell our kids about Santa. They don't believe, I don't believe, that Chick-fil-A should be closed on Sunday. Um, I often want to celebrate my Sunday with them, but they're not open. Um, They don't believe that children's church should exist. I know Christians who believe that. But there are other Christians who believe that children should never be in church with, on Sunday morning service. Like, the, you know, we, we have disagreements in life. You sh- uh, other Christians who believe, like, you should never homeschool. You should never send people to public school. I was a public school student. You should never send people to private school. I know Christians who say we should not vote. And then other Christians, these are godly people, by the way, other Christians who believe that you're going to be judged by God if you don't vote, you know, because that's like your gift, you're neglecting. And then other Christians who believe that we shouldn't even be in office, like there should be no Christians in authority at all. I know Christians who believe we shouldn't have tattoos or drink alcohol. I know Christians who believe hairless cats shouldn't exist, especially called beautiful. No, I'm just kidding, Um And I know Christians who... T- who don't believe we should take contraceptives or even medications. You should not even see a doctor. Like, I know Christians who believe those things. I don't agree with really any of those. But, um, you know, especially Halloween, you get free candy. But these are minor issues. These are not things to divide over. These are not things to start new churches over. These are not things to get all heated about. Like, these are minor issues we can compromise I just won't dress up as a Halloween character in front of you. You know, it's, you kind of submit to one another. And this, this is Romans 12.10. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's what the Bible says. Outdo one another in showing honor. How often, though, do we really try and endeavor to outdo somebody else in honoring them? They may not honor us, but how often do we outdo them in honoring them? What James was telling the Gentile Christians to do was to love their Jewish brothers and sisters and set for them an even greater example of faithfulness, holiness, and righteousness. That the Gentiles would set an even greater example of what it looks like to follow Jesus in this life. And here's the big idea. We are called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's Ephesians 5.21. We are called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ because if we are submitting to one another, we are willing to give in and not always get our way. But if we're submitting to one another specifically out of reverence for Christ, if we're revering the Lord and fearing the Lord, we're not going to be compromising on the major issues like the deity of Christ, the cross that Jesus died on for our sins, his resurrection. Like those are pretty significant issues. Um, that if it came down to it, yeah, we would have to divide. We can't really find unity because Jesus is our common ground. But if it's certain minor details, like should I celebrate Halloween or tell my kids about Santa or do any of these other things, those are minor things that we don't have to get all heated about. There is a building expansion vote. Um, again, this is one of the things that sometimes we just we disagree on. And and what I want to say is that no matter what you think, no matter what I think, we should seek to honor. We should seek to honor the leadership here. We should seek to honor the members here, our brothers and sisters who are right here in this room. Next week is the vote. So if you're a member, uh, I think it's after the church. After church, stay. We want you to vote because we want to hear your feedback. We want to hear your vote. This isn't my church. It's not Chris's church. It's not our church. This is God's church. This is God's people, and this is God's building, and everything we have is God's. And so we want, we want to know exactly what the Lord has for us. What's his vision for this church? What is his mission for this church? How does he want to expand this church? And so I ask that, that you all pray. Um, seek the Lord this week. Pray for this, because this is a big decision. 
I do want to say, as 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 your pastor, I believe um, I do believe that this is the best decision. But I'm I'm not going to attack people. I'm not going to like get mad if if it's not voted. You know, I this is not my church. This is God's church. So let's pray this week for the building expansion. And and one other thing. These deacons that are here, they love you guys. They have spent years working. I, I've been here since June. Uh, they, they have spent years working on this building expansion, trying to get to this proposal, to bring it on the table, what we heard in the ten- Connections Hour. So, so when you see them, thank them. Tell them that you appreciate them, love them. Send them a text message, I don't know, whenever they're passing out communion in just a minute. Like, Just say thank you for what they've done because they really do love this body. They really do care about this church. They really do seek to serve all of us here at Bright Hope Community Church.